Me, 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 me. <laughs> hey, Doug. Hey, Fernando. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to our art talk for our MFA candidacy exhibition. Uh, I first uh, want to thank the TCU Art Galleries for putting this together and giving us the platform to talk about our work. I also would like to stress that this talk represents uh, only half the work in the Software Fields exhibition, the other half being artists Adriana Touch and Corey Thompson. Uh, they had their art talk last week, so if you missed it, please seek it on the gallery's digital platform because it's definitely worth the watch. Um, with that being said, thank you for joining. My name is uh, Fernando Alvarez, and I am a second year MFA candidate in the painting department. Hi, my name is Doug, and I'm also listening to an echo out here. Um, so if that group could turn it down a little bit, that'd be great. Um, I'm a second year sculpture grad, um, and I primarily focus on gardening. So this is gonna be an interesting talk. Are we supposed to be introducing this video? Oh yeah, yeah I guess ahead. I am. Okay, that's me. Go ahead, Doug. Shows I was paying attention. So we've got two videos. Um, Fernando and I each put together our own separate video about our work in the show. Um, and Lene is going to start them now. Welcome to my portion of Softer Fields. This body of work, made over the span of a semester, addresses a conflict between my future and former self. It examines this year as a marker that divides my life evenly between two countries, Honduras and the United States. The recognition of this marker led to questions of cultural identity and its relation to time, and whether or not I am losing myself with each passing moment. Through this logic, I have concluded that the American version of myself is a variant of an unresolved life one that is fading and being replaced with an American identity. To emphasize this exchange, I have decided to reflect on my home through an American lens. This is manifested into text-based objects, paintings, and works on paper that reference American idioms, pop culture, and travel. Everything made for this exhibition is created out of a desperation to return and fulfill an ideal life in Honduras but that want is ultimately delusional considering that my Honduran experience was filled with violence and political turmoil. This work also touches on the inherent guilt that comes from a privileged upbringing within a relatively underprivileged country. The use of the English language and American sensibilities is telling of the untraditional conditions of my displacement, considering that an English education is indicative of privilege in a country like Honduras. Language, being a huge indicator of culture, has been an instrumental tool in addressing my displacement. One strategy I lean on is the use of American idioms, for example, using the phrases fish out of water and sleeping with the fishes to express the residual fear that comes from growing up under constant threat. Similar to the rest of the work, these pieces use foreign sensibilities, in this case pop culture references like National Geographic and Every Breath You Take, and relates them to ideas of paranoia. The focus on displacement as it relates to time has allowed me to recognize specific moments throughout my displacement and evaluate the continued effects they have on me. For example, in my piece titled Family Vacation, I am focusing on the day my family left Eusigalpa for Dallas. As is typical of my artistic practice, I am presenting a humorous object to address a moment that is otherwise difficult to talk about. In this case, the forced transition from my home country has been retroactively altered to resemble a joyous occasion, reshaping the narrative to better reflect my variant self. I achieve this by borrowing from the seemingly American tradition of custom making vacation t-shirts to commemorate a family trip. The loss of identity is sometimes voluntary in order to acclimate. On the Fence best represents this idea by treating a physical barrier as a psychological one that has authority over how I present myself. In this case, describing how phonetically I am Fernando Alvarez in one culture, but Fernando Alvarez in another. A to C deals with language most directly. This set of paintings references mid-century phonetic cards commonly used when learning how to speak English. I have always perceived these cards to represent an ideal American life, so as an act of subversion I am using my adoptive language to discuss themes relating to displacement, immigration, and being othered. Every letter is represented as a micro-alliterative statement regarding these themes. Some are specific to my story, while others are more general. 
This series aims to package the varied immigrant experience for an American audience. I decided to install this noticeably higher than gallery height to mimic what you might see in a classroom setting. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Nice video. <laughs> Great video, Doug. I felt like I was watching a, a David Lynch movie for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was really trying to channel that uh, Arc 21 experience. Yeah, no, um, it works. That actually I mean, like, I, perfectly leads into a question I had for you. Um, uh, y you, you always play like this. Uh, you're always trying to sabotage something, even if it's just slightly. <laughs> Um, but uh, you play a sort of trickster um, character with this body of work. Uh, some materials, uh, as you can see in the video, are pretending to be other ones, while separate materials continue to change after the installation. Uh, do you mind uh, touching on that attitude? Where does it come from and what is its use? You know, I was the, the youngest in my family for a really long time. And so therefore, I became the, the trickster of the family. The, the Bart Simpson, if you will. So th there's a long history of me setting up like not great booby traps, but like, you know, plastic spider falling off a door kind of experience. Um, and so that's, I think that's just anchored really deeply in this artwork is that sort of surprise of looking at one thing and not expecting to see another. And what was interesting was um, because sometimes the materials uh, fooled me and I think they also fooled uh, nature. That's how I ended up with like some bugs crawling out of things that I thought were dead and desiccated. Um, and so that, that kind of created this whole sensation of like, wait, I've confused myself and I've confused nature. Maybe I've you know, tricked the audience as well. And it's that, that point where the viewer is kind of thrown off kilter is where I feel like I'm trying to constantly catch them. Yeah, and like knowing you, I think really heightens the exhibition because knowing that there, there is that level of trickery kind of makes you have a heightened investment with the work. You're always kind of looking for something that's not quite right. Oh, here's a good question. Uh, so someone's asking, 
can a sanitized gallery environment, environment ever mirror the complexity and reciprocity inherent with the ecological systems? So I was thinking about this on the way here today. Um, I ran across, I was listening to this lecture um, talking about how when you eat like a tuna salad sandwich, you don't think about that it took the whole ocean to make that tuna, that all the systems and currents in play, because um, tuna is not, it's not farm raised. It's one of those weird fishes that just can't be. So all those systems in play go into making that tuna salad sandwich. So when you're having that very simple mundane cafeteria food, it took the whole ocean to make that. And so there's this idea that the gallery uh, and that the environments we live in are, are one area and that nature is the other. And I don't, I don't think they are. And I think that's helping me understand my own work is realizing that the sanitized gallery is oftentimes the um, last edge of the wilderness, so to speak, you know, like the, the invasion west. We, we put up these little uh, fortresses thinking that we were gonna keep the intruders away, ultimately never realizing they were, they were, they were never gonna leave. They're always okay. here and they're always here with us. Ergo, the roly polies that have escaped one of the installations and have run rampant. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite things from this exhibition. If anybody's gone to see it um, or will see it, keep a lookout. These roly polies have escaped Doug's uh, object sculpture and they're just like, literally just dying in the gallery and creating these little mounds around the space, which is just great. I mean, I do feel bad, but I also have a box of like 5,000 of them. So I'm like, mm, yeah, it's 25. Let's see. So I want to ask Fernando this question. Um, let's see. Fernando, tell us the process about uh, that you follow when you're working with found and ready-made objects in the studio. Yeah, that's that's really new for me. Um, I mean, I kind of toyed with it last uh, year a little bit, but this uh, or last semester rather, I really started using it just as an extra way to signify these ideas of of displacement or humor. I was really working specifically only in text-based paintings before that, but I quickly realized that they text on a 2D plane, it's really easy to fall into these like shallow themes. And you really, once, once you spell something out, that's really it. So really the use of ready-mades was just a means to use supplemental material to get, uh, to get more into the depth of an idea. I know when you first started, you had really kind of hinged yourself on this idea of uh, um, making like joke art or like humor art. And I think we're all like, no. <laughs> and, and sometimes it feels like the ready-made is a part of that still prop comic, you know, ready mix. Right. Doug, I have um, a, a question for you here. Uh, uh -oh. Talk about the theme of audience participation in your work. How are viewers essential to your installations and what are you hoping they walk away with? Also, is there symbol symbolism in the cicada and other insects? I have found that there's like key creatures I keep coming back to as much as I wanna run away from them. Um, one is the use of wood, uh, usually sort of oak related. Um, uh, in the yard, um, oak is like a really common material, but for some reason it was this reoccurring element that kept uh, appearing as this kind of conversation piece between um, like different family members. It was somehow as like, when you think about in time, you're like, maybe it's like a grandmother's recipe or is like, you know, grandpa's shaving kit. There's like these weird elements that kind of just carry through your family. And um, oak was one of them, in particular, the cicada. Um, and the one that kind of comes out of the ground around during uh, certain species of them. And so that cycle of rebirth, regeneration is kind of a nod to the materials and how I used them in this show. And that there were also these cycles of uh, regeneration. Yeah, speaking of materials, actually, I have a follow up question for that. Um, just because, uh, just relative to what you were doing last year, this show like really marked a drastic shift in approach for you, especially in terms of materials and aesthetics and all without compromising that type of conversation I know you're interested in. Uh, could you talk about that shift and what this new aesthetic adds to the work? 
It's so formal. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the first semester I was making, I guess it would look like science, like nature science art. Right. Um, and what was ironic was I was trying to have this conversation about how precious science or, you know, really nature was. But I ended up using all of this plastic, which was like the antithesis of everything I was sort of fighting towards was like, at all these leftover water jugs and tubing. And it was like, this seems like I need to go a different direction. Yeah. Um, and obviously let's talk about the pandemic when that hit um a lot of us were kicked out of our studios and um i was i spent the whole summer gardening in this in a community garden where resources were limited so everything had to be really uh regenerative so the plants got broken down into the compost and so um we didn't have trash pickup so you didn't use plastic because it was just it was never going to escape the the field so i kind of started thinking about how I could still work and communicate with a different set of materials while still focusing on this idea of like nature being precious and humans aren't so separate from it. I've got a question. So th this show um, points back to a period of time for you when you were about 15. I'm really curious what 15 year old Fernando would say if he saw this show. Yeah. I think you would first wonder if I was all right. Um, but yeah, mainly I, th I think you'd be so confused as to why I was like lamenting being in the US. Because like when I was younger, I always had a taste for American media and humor. And I think I'd always envisioned myself coming to the US. I mean, both my parents studied here. I had family here and we had vacation here too. Um, so I always thought I'd come here eventually, but but then we were sort of forced out and my time in Honduras was stripped from us in a very weird way. Uh, so I think a lot of my work is is sort of like me trying to undo the conditions of us leaving. Uh, but in reality, like leaving Honduras for the US is is something many Hondurans would would sign up for, um, especially those who want to pursue arts. So on that note, like I think I'd I'd partly be relieved that I found an outlet for for that propensity to make things. It, to me, it almost feels like uh, like you're homesick, but you can't ever return. Yeah, like, and if I did, do like it's feelings. Uh, you make art about it. <laughs> I, I don't know, because like even if I did return now, it's been. I mean, this show is literally talking about how it's been 16 years since I left as a 16 year old, um, and in that time, uh, a whole country changes. So, I mean, I go back and. Uh, I, I barely recognize the streets and now it's been three years since I've been back. So this has been the longest time I've, I've gone without seeing home. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll continue to unpack that. Uh, I have a question from the audience here, Doug. Uh, can you talk about your recreation of nature or simulacra of natural objects, i.e. carrots, leaves, bugs, etc.? Why recreate it? Uh, and it looks like there's an additional question about the relationship to the audience. Yes. And I think that ties into the, the video I made. Um, you know, as visual artists, I was, I've just been frustrated by this idea that we have to use so many words to explain things. And it's like, I don't feel like if I have, I need more visuals. Like I need you to experience things that cannot be said. And part of that um, it is the tactile quality and in the video, I was thinking about how um, that that mountain and that lake scene seemed so um, like foreign, and I had found it in like a photo archive, and I realized, oh shit, like that's a, like a ten minute walk from my house. Um, that's in a Cedar Ridge preserve. It's a little like duck pond, and I just happened to catch like a long video of it on a really nice idyllic day, and I realized. I don't think anyone knows what nature sounds like anymore. We're so used to traffic. We're so used to our neighbors. I'll just grab a museum um, ambient noise track and just put that in the background of this whole experience. Because it, it, to me, it seems like that mountain was almost as reverent as we hold um, you know, precious works of art. And so the cut scenes were really what I wanted the audience to experience with my work um, that was kind of poo-pooed was to actually touch it. Um, it's, it's a hard concept to get across 
that by touching an object, you can experience like that whole that whole wealth of its creation. And I know that doesn't play well in a group show because you wouldn't want drawings being touched. You wouldn't want um, the canvases being manhandled and stuff. Um, but for me, that's what I wanted, you know, is I wanted the audience to put their hands in the dirt with the roly polies to pick up the rancid looking tomatoes. And the reason I recreated some of those objects was uh, a the idea of touching a rancid tomatoes probably freaked people out. Um, but there's that surprise when you touch it and you realize, oh, wait, this isn't real. And that's sometimes this experience I, I wander into, um, like when you go to different um, retail centers where they have all these trees um, and all these shrubbery and all uh, these kinds of experiences of giving the illusion of nature, but it's, it's also fake too. Even though the plants are real, there's nothing, there's no exchange of environment. There's very few birds and bugs. And so we create these fake environments in the outside world that give us the feeling of real, um, while it's also a huge varsity. So for me, it was a microcosm of experience in this show. So Fernando, um, you want to do a, a little karaoke for us? Because I know the fish in the boombox sings for us. Yeah. Uh, that piece, which unfortunately I couldn't include the audio just because we've had issues with that. I think last semester's art talk, I tried to show that and uh, copyright whatever picked it up. But that boombox piece that was featured in the video, mm. essentially it's, it's a mold of of a dead fish that I place over a boombox that's playing uh, the police's every breath you take on a loop. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, you can do it. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> it's your art. I'm not going to do your art for you. Yeah. Well, you guys can go see the show and, and hear it for yourself. But uh, no, essentially, like I always envisioned that song to just uh, be so corny and so uh, just like out of context weird. Um, I'm not a big Sting fan, so I think that might add to it. Um, but uh, yeah, out of context, like you really read the lyrics of that song and it kind of just spoke to everything that uh, I feel as this person that's been displaced under violent conditions of constantly looking over your shoulder and, and literally feel like you're being hunted. Um, uh, but it's, it really is just a, an instance of this trend that I have in, in my work where I'm using these uh, pop culture references uh, from my childhood, things I'm really familiar with, and then twisting them in order to work in my favor. So in this case, just talking about paranoia. Have you heard how the, um, the U.S. military will use different pop music as a form of torture on a loop, almost like Muzak? Yeah, oh, I'm sure uh, Sting is somewhere on that soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, which is funny. I think Spotify has that top five uh, songs you listen to, and that was right at the top, I think, for last year. So, yeah, I'm ready to move on from that song. So I've been kind of curious, um, since we didn't have a, re a formal reception for the show, and so we didn't have, you know, the drinks and adore, uh, adores, uh kind of experience, if you could bring one, one, one dish, one flavor from the, from the motherland to show at this opening, especially talking about how much you miss home, uh, yeah. what would it be for you? Um, my immediate thought is baleadas, which is one of the few food stuff items uh, Honduras is known for. Uh, it's essentially like a street food that consists of like flour tortilla filled with refried beans and under and sour cream and like this hard salty cheese that I don't think anybody outside of Honduras likes. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, considering uh, the work I made for the show, maybe something fish related to, you know, just to beat that dead horse a little bit more. Ah, so many beatable tropes. Uh, yeah. Let's see. No more new questions. So what's next for you? What are you working on? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. The, uh, this semester kind of had a slow start, I think mainly because of the investment of, of candidacy, but I do want to touch more on, on politics, which is something that I've always avoided. Um, but my uh, 
my story is so entrenched in that like I grew up around politics and even before I was born I've had family members that were really prominent figures in Honduran politics and I really want to just analyze the stuff that came before me and how it set up uh, my life specifically like I'm super obsessed with the cold war right now like anybody that's talked to me I've probably talked their ear off about Russia and the cold war in the last year um, but I really am interested in analyzing uh, its relation to my story, like the U.S. Uh, relation, specifically the CIA's involvement in uh, Central America. So I think I'll be making uh, work about that moving forward. What about you? Uh, you know, each each semester I kind of give myself a new challenge. Um, you know, I feel like I'm always tying, purposely tying an arm behind my back uh, to sort of force myself to think a little bit more creatively. Um, and right now I'm playing with this idea of just minimizing the materials. So like, you know, this past show, I had everything from uh, Mother of Pearl to polished brass to uh, wood and other exotic things. And so this one, I'm just trying to focus with um, just linear board feet which is pretty easy to find. It's basically scraps, uh, scraps of wood um, and dowels um, and, and no glue, just trying to figure out what I can assemble um, using the same design philosophy from the show and figuring out what type of objects that makes. You know, as much as I love gardening, I also still unfortunately love making things. And so I'm always like, hemmed and hawed between where I want to be. You know, do I want to be working inside? Do I want to be working outside? And is that completely separate from like the themes you're tackling? You just want to go straight formalist or are you trying to tie it into the stuff that you're interested in? We know what's funny is uh, there's formal gardens. And I was, uh, uh, we were looking at um, Frank Stella's black paintings yesterday in a friend's class. At the same time, I was also looking at um, garden plans for formal French gardens, and they're almost like right on top of each other. And so I'm kind of just looking at how that design language works out and how ultimately you're using kind of these similar patterns that are very human oriented with also these interesting philosophies of color and texture and things like that. So it's, it's kind of like trying to figure out how to merge these two worlds I'm in love with um, and using formalism as a way to sort of uh, bridge that gap for right now. Now, so we have a question that says, uh, Fernando, can you talk about your process for making A to Z? I've always kind of pictured you being like a, um, a substitute teacher writer for SNL. And I think in, with this particular work, you really see the, the humor side of you really come out, but in these really subtle jabs that I really enjoyed. Yeah, the, the process for that, that was one piece that really took all semester to get together. There was a few different iterations to how I wanted to present it, but it was um, the writing process itself um, probably took just as long as making the work um, but essentially, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of just figuring out um, what three words for every letter could um, touch on these themes that I'm interested in. It was really more of an exercise and kind of what you're talking about, like comedy writing. It was, it was just these parameters that I set for myself. It was like, I wonder if I could touch on this theme with every letter using only words that start with that letter. Um, yeah, yeah it, go ahead. you know, Q's and W's and X's, you know, those those triple letter scores in Scrabble are oh not easy. No, X, X was brutal. Uh, it, it took a forever to find out those those, uh, I guess, more difficult letters. But yeah, ultimately, like, um, yeah, you have I, a favorite. I, a favorite. Um, so do you have I, a favorite that really describes this whole experience, like from, you know, coming from uh, Honduras to America. Oddly enough, the my I have I think three favorites, and they're all like very self-deprecating, which I think that that yeah. type of humor uh, I just gravitate towards. But there's uh, one that describes the process is uh, letter M is mighty misery magnet. Um, what is the other <laughs> one? Oh, W is woeful weepy wimp, and one that I really uh, like because it speaks specifically to something that's almost um it's 
so adjacent to, to the displacement thing, but only slightly related, which was P, which stands for Paranoid Punk Poser, which was really more about me being in Honduras, really liking American music, but this really dumbed down version of, of punk rock and mall rock and me wearing Blink-182 and Offspring t-shirts and thinking I was so hardcore. Um, in Honduras, so, mind you. Yeah, in Honduras. So, uh, okay, so I know we have to wrap this up. Um, we do have one more week left for uh, viewing it. It's kind of a tricky thing because right now they're only letting uh, students and people registered, uh, I guess, employees through the school um, can go see it. Um, on the TCU gallery webpage, there is um, a 3D walkthrough, which is kind of cool. It almost feels like you're playing one of those old shoot 'em up games. <laughs> Um, and I really wanted to do a video about that, but I decided making a Doom reference might be a little out of date. Um, but so we have a week left for it. Um, it's You can view the individual works on Artsy, which is nice because they're really nice, clean images. Um, and apparently we have MFA uh, applications are due Monday. So if you, um, if you out there want to get your own um, MFA degree, this is, as far as I know, it's still fully stipend, comes with the studio and most of the studios are heated, so it's not so bad. You get to hang out with us for a year. Oh, that's a bad idea. Uh, but yeah, and just to reiterate all the, all the virtual programming um, that you can check out, that's in the description for the video. So make sure to check that out. Do you have any closing remarks before we uh, end this thing? Uh, I love you, Doug. Oh, I love you too. Doug, can I miss her? Good job. She's cuter thanks, than everybody. you, so I love her more. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. <laughs>